A warm welcome to God Day. I hope you are well. And today, I want to talk about starting over, that it's okay to start over. And I was watching something on YouTube, and this guy said, imagine if you're 50 years old, you failed at your relationship, maybe you have estranged kids, estranged wife, and you're back at home with your parents, and you have zero money in the bank account, but you have some debts, and actually, you have less money at 50 than you had when you were 15 living with your, with your parents. And, you know, at 50 years old, suddenly, would you have the energy to start over again? And I just want to say that wherever you are in life, you might be comfortable, but you have a, something in you that you want to do something new. And maybe the Holy Spirit is birthing something new in you, but maybe you're a little, I don't know, fearful about doing something new in your life, starting over yet again. But I want to say it's okay to, to start over. And maybe, you know, you're not in a dramatic position like that. You're 50 years old, back with your parents. But perhaps you feel a little stuck like you've been in the same place a little too long, you want to do something new in your life, you're just kind of coasting, maybe just maintaining your life, but not really shaking it up, not doing anything new, not starting over that perhaps you did when you were in your 20s. Because when you were in your 20s, you said, I had so much energy. But I think even in our 80s, even at 60, I feel the energy of God upon me. Many times when I'm doing something new, but I also feel the resistance as well. And I love this. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computers, he said this. He said, I have looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. And you know, with God, I was just thinking of that passage of Scripture, well, Lamentations, the book of Lamentations. It's really Jeremiah walking around Jerusalem, and it's in shambles. It's been destroyed. Even the temple of God has been destroyed. And Jeremiah is just looking at it, bemoaning his fate, bemoaning his people's fate. He's not in a very good mood. He's accusing God of not listening to him, of not being involved in his life. He actually feels like really despondent, like, God, what's happening? And then God speaks to him and says the most beautiful thing it's in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Now, imagine this. Imagine if you're walking around London or your place of residence and it's completely destroyed and suddenly you he hear these words being spoken to your spirit. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, I want to say, not only is it okay to start over, God is the God of start overs. He loves when his children come in repentance, in humility, in vulnerability, not saying, I can do it, let me show you what I can do, God, but just come to him with a repentant, humble, but yet a very expectant spirit, saying, you know what? It seems almost impossible. You know, when you're 50 years old, living with your parents, everything you've done has failed, and you dare to have this hope. You dare to say, well, you know what? I want to start over. God loves that spirit. When he says, Father, I need you in my life. I need you to give me the energy, to help me to start over, to do something new, to do something different in my life. And that's his specialty. And I love that. It's like the steadfast love and his, his mercies are renewable every morning. Like they never run out. They never run dry. It's like renewable energy that's free. All we have to do is ask for it. All we have to do is plug into that energy and with that energy of his mercies, because really we can't do anything new. We can't start over if we don't understand mercy and grace. We'll just say, if I'm 50 years old and I'm living with my parents and I'm blaming everybody else and, and I think I should have done this and I'm regretting my past, okay, I don't understand mercy. I don't understand grace, that it's a free gift. 
that God and I, when I understand that wonderful grace and I appropriate God's mercies in my life, then suddenly starting over can actually be quite enjoyable. So I wanna talk about four ways it's okay to start over, okay? Four ways it's okay to start over. Number one, it's okay to start over, but, okay, there's, there's four points, but there's four buts as well, okay? It's okay to start over, but only if you are focusing on your dreams and not your debts. I'm gonna say that one more time. It's okay to start over, okay? But only if you are focusing on your dreams and not your debts. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, we put so much energy, I know so many people that are blocked from starting over because all of their energy is not going to their startup. All of their energy is not going to starting over. All of their energy is going back into the past, blaming people for circumstances, saying what they should have done, feeling sorry for themselves. It's like the, the, the past is this weight just dragging them down and that's a debt. So they're spending their entire lives trying to make up for their debt, to justify their debt, to explain their debt, to excuse themselves because of their debt, the past. And that's not right. I love what the Apostle Paul says. I love this. And this is the Passion Translation. And it brings out the Greek fairly accurately. And it's in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. I don't depend on my own strength, Paul says, to accomplish this. Okay, you're starting over. And you just say, God, I'm not depending this time on my own strength to accomplish this, okay? However, I do have one compelling focus, something that grabs my attention, something that I'm focusing on in the future. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past, the toxic, the bad things, not the lessons learned, not the good things, Okay? I forget all of the past, all of the debts, as I fasten my heart to the future instead. And I, I love that, as he fastens. You, you see, when you move forward, when you want to start over, please, please don't focus on the past. Don't focus on your debts, but focus on your dreams. Focus on what God wants you to do. Focus on the gift that is inside you. Focus on what is before you and put all your energy into that. My wife and I counsel so many people, and it's always, every time we sit down with somebody, they're blaming, they're talking about what happened in the past, and you know, 90% of the counseling session, we don't allow it, could just be focusing, oh no, it's okay, you did right, oh, that person did wrong, oh, I'm sorry about that, oh no, no, you're not sorry, you don't understand me, oh yes, I'm sorry, and we're focusing on the debt, but not the dream, not like how can we move forward? I think in marriage counseling, it, 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 this is very apt. Sometimes you can go, a couple can go into a marriage counselor and you're spending the whole, I don't know, the whole first year of counseling just focusing on what someone did wrong instead of saying, look, you know, we realize that we're both sinners. We realize that we both made mistakes, but what kind of a future do we want? What is our dream for our marriage, for our children, for our family? Let's focus on the dream, not focus on the debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who, the, you know, who owe us money or who have sinned against us. So it's okay to start over, but only if you're focusing on the dreams and not your debts. So that's very, when you catch your mind, say if you're starting over and you're doing something new and then you can just feel the past kind of coming into you, dragging you back down. Just say goodbye, I have a good future in God. God has plans for me to bless me. He has a future for me and I'm gonna focus on the dreams and not the debt. Number two, it's okay to start over but not by yourself. I'm gonna say this again, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this one, okay? It's okay to start over, but not by yourself. I don't know how it is in the UK, but in America, we have a saying, you know what, I got myself into this mess, so I'm gonna get myself out of this mess. It's my responsibility, so it's my responsibility to get myself out of this mess. And basically, you're just gonna, you know, how many times have you done that? Got yourself out of that mess. 
but you've still failed. But really, you know, it's okay to start over, but don't do it yourself. I don't know if you've seen any of those movies like with George Clooney, Ocean's Eleven, I think it's Ocean's Eleven, and it's not Ocean's One. Okay, George Clooney, what, did he want to hijack a casino, rob the casino of something, get some jewelry? I can't remember, but he had a plan, he had a dream that he wanted to rob the casino, but he knew he could not do it by himself. So he spent, what, a quarter of the movie recruiting people, the right people. So quarter of the movie is just how he recruits the people, the right people to join on his team. So it's not called Ocean's One, it's called Ocean's Eleven because he needed help. He couldn't realize his dream alone. And so many Christian people I see, it's just like they're saying, look, I have to do this all by myself. It's my dream, my responsibility, and I'm going to go for it. And then they get exhausted, burnt out, they fail, they end up blaming people. It just doesn't work. So really, we have to move from, how do I call it? We have to remove, we have to move away from the I, the me, 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 the I, I, I that has to do it, and move to we. So we have to kind of take the I out of the, not out of the equations, but we have to move from I and go from we can do it together. For example, it doesn't say that you are more than a conqueror, doesn't say that. Doesn't say that in the Bible. I'm, I know a lot of pastors get up there and they say, you are more than a conqueror. No, you're not. It says we together, we are more than conquerors. God has gifted the church with all of these gifts and these abilities. And when we get together and we work in unity, that's what it means to be more than conquerors. That's a lot of pressure. If I say to somebody, you are more than a conqueror, and then you look at your life and you say, hold on, I'm 50 years old. I'm still living with my parents. I don't see any evidence of that in my life, that how can I be more than a conqueror? But you know, you can be more than a conqueror when you're together with the people that God has placed in your life to accomplish the dream or the noble activity that you want to accomplish in your life. Um, so usually, how can I say that? We overestimate, overdream, and overvalue what we can do alone, and we underestimate, underdream, and undervalue what we can do together. In other words, you know, we always talk about, I have a vision, I have a dream, and I can do this. And we almost overestimate what we can do alone, and we underestimate what we can do together. This is really, really important. Man, I had to learn this the hard way so, so many times. I, I remember we had a, a couple, well, our church was just at a standstill. It wasn't going anywhere. Melanie and I were leading it, but Melanie and I don't have all the gifts. Okay, no matter how nice we might come across, we don't have all the gifts. So the church was just in a period of stagnation. Then a friend of mine from the UK, he said, Kurt, I have a couple that I've just recruited, okay, to help you to bring good governance in the church. And they came in and wow, it was, it was just like all the, the dreams I had just happened so easily with them and the choosing of other leaders. And when we approached it as a team, we could accomplish so much more and we could have fun doing it. Whereas before it was just like a burden. Oh, I have to do the finances by, by myself. I have to do this by myself and this by myself. And when we got it equitably distributed, you know, with a, with a leadership team, it was absolutely beautiful. In fact, um, I'm from America, as you can hear. Okay, and in 1985, imagine this, in 1985, we had a big competition in Chicago, and that was like the, 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 mule, the mule championship. So what happened is you'd have a team of mules, say six mules, 20 mules, I, I forget how many, and you'd hitch all the mules up together, and they would have to carry all of these logs. So during this competition, the winning mule team actually hauled uh, 9,000 pounds of logs. And then the runner up, the one that came in second place, hauled just slightly less than 9,000 pounds of logs. And then one guy, he has this brilliant idea. He said, let's do an experiment. Let's like hitch up both teams of mules, like team A and you know the, the one that came in first place, the one that came in the second place. We're gonna hook them up together and we're gonna see how many pounds of logs that they can haul. 
Now, most people said, well, probably around 18,000, because 9,000 plus 9,000, that equals 18,000. So probably they'll haul around, if they work together into two teams, they'll probably haul 18,000 pounds. But guess what? A surprising thing happened. They hauled not 18,000 pounds, which everybody predicted, but they hauled 30,000 pounds of logs. There's something so powerful about being together. I love this because uh, this process of working with our differences or in different teams, it's called synergy. So synergy is not getting together necessarily like-minded people. When we had that team at our church, we didn't think alike. We had like green light people like me, go for it, go for it, go for it. And then we also had red light people, stop, be careful, slow down. But when we got together, instead of hauling 18,000 pounds of logs, you know, we hauled over 30,000 pounds. So that's called synergy. And if we don't have that, if we don't have people in our life, the ocean's 13 is never going to happen. Our dream is going to be very, very difficult um, to reach. Like, for example, even the Bible says this. One puts a thousand to flight. Two puts, you would expect, 2,000 to flight. Hold on, let's, let's slow down here, okay? One puts a thousand to flight, right? So if you have two people, you'll put 2,000 people to flight, right? But the Bible speaks synergistically. It says, one puts a thousand to flight, two puts 10,000 to flight. The Bible even says when two or three are gathered together and we agree on something, then it becomes possible. It doesn't say where there's two or 300. It doesn't set the bar that high. It just says, hey, get a couple other people on your team to agree with you that you have this vision, that you can do it. And I love this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider and give, I like this kind of um, amplified Bible. And let us consider and give attentive, continuous care to watching over one another. You could say, oh, I don't want anybody watching over me, but hold on, okay? Studying and analyzing how we may stir up, provoke, encourage, stimulate, incite, and excite each other to love and helpful deeds and noble activities. Where do you see the individual? Where do you see the person? Oh, I'm just gonna go up the mountaintop and it's just God and me. You know, it's not by might, not by power, it's by the spirit and it's just God and me. But it doesn't say that. The spirit works through the gifts. For example, I could say to you, say if there's a Betty out there, Betty, oh, um, and Betty says, I'm going to go up to the mountain and ask God for encouragement. So Betty goes all the way up to the mountain to ask God for encouragement. And, Ger and, and uh, God says to Betty, Betty, I want you to go to your local church. And there's a guy called Frank. And he has the gift of encouragement that the Holy Spirit has given him. And he is going to be the one to encourage you. Okay, so we, we have to be vulnerable. We have to be interdependent on other people. And here it says, stir one another up. So it's back to that Ocean's Eleven. It's back to that team, okay? In fact, what I call it is a personal power team. I believe, I believe that every Christian should spend a lot of time recruiting and putting together and growing what I call a personal power team. For example, say if you have a vision, okay? I've had a vision, but I'm terrible at finances. I just block up when I have to go to the bank and, and do tax returns. I'm just terrible at that. Why wouldn't I, okay, spend a couple weeks trying to find and track down and recruiting that person for my personal power team? Maybe he wants to learn the classical guitar, which I play, and I could like barter with him and say, you know what? I'll teach you three hours of guitar every month if you do three hours of financial work and advice for me. You see, I'm not going to get to my vision if I'm sloppy with my finances and suddenly I run out of money and I'm a missionary in Mexico and I have to turn around because I've messed up my finances. So I need somebody on my personal power team, me, because I'm bad at finances, that is good. Like in our church, we have a, a woman who is just so good at finances. And when I handed the finances over to her, as part of my personal power team. Man, my life, my marriage, 
everything, everything improved because I no longer had that dread. Oh, I have to do it. Oh, I've postponed again. Oh, I procrastinated again. And, you know, then you need other people. Maybe you're good at finances, but maybe you're bad at public speaking. Maybe you're bad at um, promoting yourself. Like you're an author and you finally write your book, but you're too shy to publicize your book and, and get out there. It's always been your dream to write a book. You get a publisher, you, you write a book, but no one is buying your book. Okay, so you need to recruit somebody on your power team. Maybe you're an AA. AA works like this. I mean, AA works like this. Look, you're not going to get anywhere in AA out of addiction without a personal power team. It's almost impossible to overcome addiction by yourself. And if you do, you might have some, 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 some ongoing problems. But usually, um, you know, if you're addicted to something, you go to a group. And then in that group, you choose a sponsor, somebody that can call you once a week, you can talk to, you can confess your sins and your shortcomings to, somebody that will encourage you, and then you can get over your addiction. But you need a personal power team. Okay, uh, number three, it's okay to start over, but only if your daily routines are in sync with your dreams. Let me, let me say that this is important. It's okay to start over, but only if your daily routines are in sync with your dreams. And do a little test right now, okay? Say you are starting over. Say you are doing something new. Say you felt that God is calling you to do something. Maybe you failed at it. Maybe, you know, you're protecting yourself and you don't want to bring it up because you, you fear failure, that you look bad, something will happen. But say if you're starting this up and you have a dream and, and you have um, a vision, and then you have to ask yourself, is everything that you're doing, your daily habits, in sync? Is everything that you're doing, all your routines, all your day, daily habits, is it taking you closer to your dream or further away from your dream? Believe it or not, most people that my wife and I counsel, they have these wonderful dreams and they get all excited about their vision. And then we take them through what they do with every hour of the day, 24-7. And we saw one person flipping through the TV channels, uh, social media, this, and almost everybody that Melanie and I counsel, almost every one of them, their daily habits, their routines, their, their, their rituals are taking them further away from their dream. They're, they're actually sabotaging them. So that's why God says, choose life that you may live. Okay, we have to choose things that are not going to hinder us or bring toxicity in our lives, but we have to choose things that will take us closer to our dreams. For example, I have a, one message that I preach, maybe I'll write a book on it, called Daniel's Window. And in Daniel 6.10, it says this, his house, Daniel's house, had windows in the upstairs that opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he knelt there in prayer, thanking and praising his God. Now, Daniel had a vision. His, he had the architects and the builders build him windows that faced Jerusalem. He wasn't in Jerusalem. He was in Babylon, okay? So his vision was the restoration of Jerusalem, to get his people back in Jerusalem and make it into a wonderful, godly kingdom. That was his vision. Okay, but he didn't stop there. That was like outside the window. Okay, it's like most of us, we get excited about visions that are outside the window, but we need to practice the part of the vision that's the hardest that's on this side of the window, on the inside of the window. So his habits, he prayed, he praised God, he thanked God, he got down on his knees, maybe he, he danced, he, he read the word, and he did that three times a day. So everything Daniel did, all his habits, all his routines, all his rituals supported the vision of seeing Jerusalem restored once again. So what routines can we put into place that will take us closer to, you know, our dreams and our vision? Number four, it's okay to start over, but only if you upgrade your thought life, okay? I love what Al Albert Einstein says. He says, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different 
results. If you're going to do something new, you can't use the thinking of yesteryear. You can't use the thinking of the world. You have to upgrade your thinking um, big time. So if you, if you do a little study or a little experiment, is the way that you are thinking bringing you closer to your vision or closer to your dream or actually further away? And I love this in Romans 12, verse 2. It says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. And I love this, that we need a total reformation of how you think. And again, my wife and I, we've counseled so many people. They're negative. They're hopeless. They're blaming people. They think that they can't do it. They think that, you know, they're not good enough. And their thinking is completely different. And Father God, we thank you. I wish I could go on for another hour. We thank you for the dear, precious people that are watching this, Lord. And we pray that you would totally reform the way that we think, that we would think of what's good, praiseworthy, excellent, beautiful. And we thank you, Lord, that it's okay to start over. It's okay to go for those subdued, trodden down dreams. Waken us up, resurrect us, and we love you. And God bless you. And I will see you on another occasion. Bye.